What's happening, world? I'm your host, the Wizard of Wands, Benji Wozniak. And Joseph Skuldron Knight asked us to do this movie. It is Mad Monster Party, a 1967 stop motion cartoon ish. So, uh, Kira? Yeah. So I actually thought, because when this movie was suggested to us, we hadn't really started a lot of our Abba and Costellos. And I thought that Boris Korloff being in this movie actually is like really fitting to the theme of like our movies lately. So great recommendation. Very fun film. Like you said, it is a stop motion animation from 1967. So I'm in the camp of not minding stop motion animation. Like we were talking a little bit before we got on, um, it does remind you of like the Rudolph and the Mr. Heat Miser and the like si- the Land of Lost Toys. I forget all those, all those like Christmas movies. Yes. It had yeah. that like kind of style, which was cool. But of course, we have all the classic monsters. We had Frankenstein's monster, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Dracula, the mummy. I thought it was interesting that they included the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yes, yes, as a, as a classic monster. As yes. a classic monster because, for those who don't know, it is more than a Disney story. It is based on a book by Victor Hugo. And the book is actually deeply traumatizing and sad. And I don't, and I think it's weird that they paint that, because I don't think the Hunchback is a monster, so it's weird in this movie for me to see him in that. Yeah, I do believe there was like a 19... 19- 50 or 60s movie with the hunchback where he kind of plays a, not really a, a villain but he gets villainous in the movie yeah and he becomes bitter i think that's where they got it from like he kind of was not a good guy in that movie oh absolutely and of course we see that like monster origins always get kind of warped throughout i just i just like the hunchback so the, for as a tragic character Similar to Frankenstein's monster, I find that they're both like these very tragic characters that are painted poorly. So to see them in things like this, it kind of like, it doesn't rub me the wrong way. It just kind of irks me a little bit. Yeah, that's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I've read the books. Exactly. And Mr. Hyde is actually like four foot tall. Yeah. He's not a tall monster like that, you know, can hurt people. Well, he hurts people. He's he's got a lot of strength, but he's little. He's not like a gigantic person. No. And then every time you see... Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, they make him into like this hideous big creature that can rip you apart. And in, in the book, he's not that He's at not all. that at all. Especially, and I think one of the most egregious ones was in A League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Oh, yeah, he's huge. Huge. Massive. They have to like hold him back with chains. I was like, this isn't, this isn't it. But okay, we digress. Let's get back into the story. So, digress. <laughs> so Boris Korloff plays Dr. Frankenstein, and he is the leader of the monster organization of the world. It is like kind of insane saying like the logic that all these monsters are together in like a un- like a monster union just like <laughs> living amongst the shadows why not <laughs> why not so but within well, he so he has to gather all these people together because he is unveiling the fact that he created basically like a nuclear bomb yes yeah, is like what destroy matter yeah a glowing thing that can destroy matter i was like oh a nuke oh okay yeah. <laughs> i get where we're going with this and then he's going to have his nephew who he's never met before no. who is a human a bumbling human yes. take over and all the monsters are rightfully pissed and so then of course they try to undermine an attack and it, it, hijinks is, ensue of course it is i feel like this was more to- for like children yes oh 100 percent. what was it? the secretary francesca yeah yeah she's the one that basically wants to be the next person in charge and feels that dr frankenstein by letting his nephew who he's never met take over that she, he's undermining her and the monsters. And then basically the monsters kind of feel the same way too. Absolutely. So I think, so we have two kind of main antagonists in the movie. We have the duo of Francesca and Dracula, because she's like, I can manipulate Dracula. And then we have the duo of the creature, which is Frankenstein's monster and the monster mate, who was, what, what was her name? Who? Phyllis Diller. Phyllis. And she is honestly a scene stealer. Yeah. Phyllis Diller was... Very famous in the 60s and 70s. Very funny, very talented comic and actress. And singer. I mean, so I didn't know that this movie was going to have songs in it. Yes. I didn't think it was a musical. So when she busted out singing how hideous and awful and horrible Frankenstein's monster is, I was like, what the heck is happening? (laughs) I was like, I think they call him Fang in the movie. So when she's singing about Fang, she's like, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're disarming, which is alarming. Like, it was the most roasting song I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, it was, because she basically catches him peeking on Francesca, because Francesca's a pretty, pretty doll, like, uh, if that makes sense. It was supposed to be a pretty person, but it's a doll. So it's a pretty doll, and Frankenstein looks through the door at her, and then she 
caught by his wife, and his wife's like, listen, you are no catch. She's like, I'm doing you a favor, basically. Exactly. And I think it's so funny. So we have Francesca, who is built like what I would assume every male who's never actually met a woman would draw a woman. Massive tits, no waist, hips. Where is she? Who is she? And then you have the monster mate, who is dumpy, looks like a witch. (laughs) horrifying and then there's one scene so now they're all pit- getting pitted against each other because they all want to undermine dr frankenstein and they don't want his nephew to take over so francesca and the monster mate end up fighting tell me why this this is how i know it was written by a man and i saw it in the credits is that both the ladies have their dresses removed and then fight in their undergarments for what please make that one make sense to me because Men are pigs. Men are pigs. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Men are pigs. It was horrifying. I was like, what? And it's dolls. Why and it's you, dolls. Why are you dolls stripping down to the undies? Come on, man. I know. It's like, um, do you ever see that one movie, uh, World America? No. What is it? Team America, World oh, Police. Yeah, that's so uh, raunchy. It's so raunchy. It was like, I feel like this movie, that one scene birthed that whole movie because it was bad. So now we have them all fighting and then Felix comes in. Yes. And yes. he is a, a human. And he is the nephew that, but maybe he has like witch blood in him. It's like the story does not make sense. No. So if you're from the Frankenstein family, you somehow have mythical blood in you. And his mom was a good witch and then left. And now he's a pharmacist assistant and bad at it. He has allergies. He's coughing all the time. <laughs> I hated his voice. His voice was annoying. Isn't I it? hated it. Whoever played that had the worst voice ever. And it made me not like the movie because of that. I was like watching it going, his voice just does not fit this person. It was awful. I know because they kind of, ha- he has like this like kind of like nasally squeaky sort of just like, I don't know, someone as you would describe like a, I don't, I, you can't describe it. It's a war. It's like a shrill man, which yeah. I think is the worst a man can be. It was be. Just awful. I mean, I, the movie was good, but uh, his voice just racked me. Every time he talked, I was like, oh, please shut up, just shut up and do something. But then I thought it was funny because he bumbles his way through the whole movie. He can't find his glasses, so he's nice to all the monsters. He thinks uh, the wolf man is a woman in furs. Like, it's very funny. Yeah. He He's like, oh, I can't see you to the invisible man. And he's like, oh, I've never heard that one. Like, he makes these, like, very funny jokes, and he's very unassuming. And then one of the best scenes is when Francesca and Dracula set him up at the picnic. So Francesca's like, we're going to kill him. So Fr- Frankenstein's, like, trying to, like, get to him. And he keeps diving into this picnic basket for what seems like 30 sandwiches for two people. Yeah. And I was like, first of all, who who made this picnic? Yeah. And then Dracula's like trying to grab him at every turn and can't. And I just think I love that kind of comedy because it reminded me of Abba and Costello where we have Costello kind of bumbling around. And then we have, you know what I mean? It's kind yeah. of like that physical comedy, even though we're, we're in an animated style. So I thought that was really funny. But I do want to talk about the sandwiches that were in the picnic. Don't know why I'm harping on this. Parsley and rye. That's a full <laughs> sandwich. Cheese with mayo. I mean, that one makes more sense to me. But I was like, what is happening? And then he's like, oh, here's just one with cheese. Who made this picnic? Why are there 30 types of sandwiches for two people? Yeah, it was funny. No, remind me, like, I liked part two when um, the, they go in to talk about the meal being made for the party. And, like, this, the guy sings a song <laughs> about what's in it. Like, he's like, I made the salad dressing with arsenic. And, uh, cyanide. Oh, cyanide. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell am I watching here? It was, it was, it was a funny movie. It's a lot of. A lot of childish humor. Uh, it, it was. It's good if you want to watch something like that's a. Ori- it's an original movie, like movie from like the 1960s, and it's entertaining. I thought it was very entertaining, and to go back to that kitchen scene because I loved the chef in that. I yes. love that his name was Mafia Machiavelli. I thought <laughs> that was a perfect name. He's making all this crazy poisonous food. And his song, the way he sang it and danced around, reminded me of the chef from The Little Mermaid when he's like singing, trying to kill Sebastian. (laughs) I was like dying. I loved that scene. And then who is also in that scene, which who was my least likely, my least favorite character in the whole movie, Yetch. Yetch. I have so many thoughts and I hated him. I love a dim-witted like helper or like servant which is what he was he was like a little butler and he was kind of dumb he gave me like igor vibes which i was like into but then 
He also gave me the most incel vibes in the world, constantly trying to touch and kiss on Francesca, constantly being and Dracula feeding into it and being like, he, he should have given her to you. Like, oh, women are property. OK, cool. Yeah, this movie definitely came out in 1967. And like I just like and then he was like, well, you're mine. I'm going to kiss you. I'm going to do whatever. And then when King Kong like yeets him into the like universe, that was my that was one of my favorite parts. Yeah, I, absolutely. And, you know, the funny thing is about like about women. So Francesca wants to kill Felix right. until Felix slaps her. And then she's like, I love you. Yeah. And then he, she's like, I fall in love with you. And it reminds me of like those those old French dances where the man's smacking the woman and like, yeah. you know, and like she's loving it. And I'm like, you know, this is the wrong thing to portray. I'm like, just no. This is the wrong thing to portray. And guess what? I am a woman. And in my whole life, I've never met a woman. Like, yes. I'm not kink shaming anyone. Yes, kinky things can happen. But to just physically assault someone and then be like, I love you. Like, it is clearly so written by a man. I, that part, I was so mad. And then, so now she's in love with him for the whole movie, right? Yes, yeah. And then he's like, she's like, let's run away together. We're going to run away. We're going to do whatever. And Felix is like, yeah, you're hot. Like, let's go. Yeah. She actually gets betrayed by Dracula and Frankenstein monster and Mrs. Frankenstein. Yes. So she comes up with a plan to get rid of everybody. She's like, I'm going to get rid of everybody. She sends a letter to King Kong. Right. Which is, and then King Kong comes up and he is just bigger than the whole <laughs> castle. <laughs> I was like, this d- is <laughs> hilarious. It was so funny. I was like, how small are these people for King Kong to tower over this whole castle? But then obviously, spoiler, of course, this is a spoiling podcast. They all blow up and die because uh, Dr. Frankenstein drives a nuclear, drives a plane like a kamikaze pilot with his nuclear material. What? <laughs> yeah. So so the planes, Felix talks to his uncle about the planes and he goes, yeah, we had Wilbur and over over. And he goes, right. And he goes, no, Frankenstein. <laughs> He goes, there was their idea to do this. And like, it, there's a lot of like little innuendos in the movie that make you just like, you know, like smirk because you're like, oh, this is kind of funny. Here's the thing. I found the movie for, I mean, I know I'm focusing on the flaws, but the movie was wildly witty. Yes. And yes. the banter was good. The songs were good. It was everything may not have made sense, but it was fun. And it was kind of this like kooky world that they kind of made. And then I like at the end, Felix is like, Francesca, we're going to run away together. And then she's like, I'm a robot. I'm going to rust. And then he's kind of and he's like, it doesn't matter. I still love you. And then he starts like glitching out. Like, I loved that. Like that kind of like, oh, are you a robot too? Are you actually human? What's going to happen? Like, and then it fades into black. You know, the funny part about that too is she doesn't really get upset until he mentions children. Exactly. Which is, yes, but keep going with your thought. And yeah, I, so when they're talking, he gets all excited and he's talking about marrying her and loving her and she's excited for it. And then he goes, and I can't wait to have children. You know, little Felix one, little Felix, and then like, that's when she kind of like, her, her whole demeanor changes and she's like totally devastated because she can't give him what a normal woman could give him. And then she even says to him, you know, why do you think I was on this island? Because after the, the master failed with the, the, the monster and his wife, he made me the perfect specimen. Oh, yes. Because women have no value in a marriage unless they can produce children. This is what this and this mentality doesn't make sense for a robot to have. Because how would an AI know about giving life? It doesn't make sense. An AI can know about manipulation. They can know about human emotion, but they have no true empathy or sympathy. They have none of that. Right. So how can she like sympathize with him and be like, oh, you want this? I can't give this to you. We, therefore, we can't be together. How would she have that cognitive ability? It does. It just I know I'm diving it. It's an animated movie. I know. But it just doesn't make sense to make this point about like about children. And I know it's not that point but that's how it comes across yeah and not to mention the fact she had all the knowledge of dr frankenstein except making the destructive potion so she knew how to make life like she, she could make a life she could literally make little robot babies like yeah. it's not it's just it, it's like these insane heteronormative ideas that are just like pushed through in these subtle ways that make like literally no sense yeah i mean if you look at it's a children's show so you really shouldn't have all this like, look at Frosty, and the, they don't really have these underlying, you know, like, yeah. stereotype stuff as this movie did. This movie had some very underlying stereotypical concepts of women and men. It did. And, I mean, 1967, 
and we're watching it with a 2022 lens, like we're going to have obvious like discrepancies. But I just think it's insane to see that how much was pushed through in that time. Just like so like un- not under the radar, but like kind of under the radar. Like, I don't know. It I don't know. It just like Francesca's character for uh, she was like the classic femme fatale, smart, hot, cunning, will deceive you, will try to kill you, falls in love with you. Like all like she fits like this very like distinct stereotype. And then to have her downfall within her own self be like, oh, I can't have kids. It's like, babe, you're a robot and you know that you're a robot. Like, yeah. And, you know, her looks and everything. My wife was sitting with me and she goes, is that supposed to be Anne Margaret? And I went, I really don't know. Oh, and my I, God. I was like, I don't know. And she looked it up and it didn't tell you. It just told you who played it. But she looked like Anne, Anne Margaret. Margaret. She yeah. did. Yep. And it's just, I don't know. like a So, yeah, the portrayal of Francesca is questionable at best. Yeah. Yes. But I think it was interesting because, like, when we watched the first Abbott and Costello movie, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Yes. I found a lot of parallels to Francesca and the assistant in that movie with yes. the black hair. I forget her name. Sorry, yes. guys. That was a few movies ago. And I thought it was interesting how those movies, how that movie, how Abbott and Costello came out like 20 years before and the women weren't as reductive as they no. were in this. No. And actually, the, the assistant in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, she was actually the doctor that was going to do the the stuff to fix Frankenstein. So she was really intelligent and really on point. Whereas Francesca was kind of the same scenario, but a second hand. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I just think that is so shocking because we're always like, oh, the further in time you go, like the worse it is. But it's like, no, like I would rather watch Ab- the portrayal of women in Abba and Costello meet Frankenstein versus this movie. Yeah. Except for Phyllis Diller. She was hysterical. Oh my God. Phyllis Diller was so funny. I mean, she just played the the rude, shrill wife who's just like, I'm smarter than my husband. Look at him. He's a lump. He's a, he's nothing. He would be nothing without me. I killed me. Yeah. I like the part when Francesca jumps down the hole <laughs> and then they're like, I wonder what's at the end of the hole. And like, she's like, wait a minute. And she's like, bang, throw him down the hole. <laughs> so I know. She throws Dracula down the hole. <laughs> Or like, this is what I, like, she obviously hit a lever, right? Francesca obviously hit a lever to make this floor open up. And then the guys are like, oh, she vanished. Where did she go? What will we do? We should hide. And then Phyllis Diller's like, guys, she literally hit a button. Like, yeah. let's go. <laughs> I love how like, once once she escapes, Dracula's like, all right, I'm out. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. He starts packing his coffin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's Phyllis like, guys, they're going to kill me. Like, give me away. So it was like, chill out. <laughs> so like, I got this. I was like, I was like, this is funny. It is funny. They didn't realize that Dr. Frankenstein would kill them all, though. <laughs> yes. Yes. He took them out. He, was, he wasn't he wasn't playing. And I, I thought that part was kind of funny because, you know, here he is. He's the you know, control of all these monsters. And once he realizes that they tried to kill his nephew, that he's like, you know what? We all got to go. We all got to go. We all got to go. I don't care who you are. You're out of here. You know? Goodbye. And yeah. I just like, you know, I would say in all the ways I saw this movie ending, did not expect that one coming. No, <laughs> not at all. And it had some, like, it did have, like, portrayed a lot of the monsters. It had the Invisible Man. It had the Creature from the Black Lagoon. It had the Wolfman, Dr. Jekyll. So it did have, like, for that time period that was on television. Oh, it had so many. Yeah, it had the ones that were focal pointed in movies and in, on television. And I thought it was really I thought it was cool to see them all get together. I was hoping I think because I think this movie laid base for like something really cool if it was done like today. Like I love like a murder mystery setting. So I thought it'd be so cool if like they all kind of turned on each other and didn't really like partner up. I don't know. I had like a lot of expectations going in, but very fun. Yeah. And I what was it about five, six years ago? They had plans to do a monster verse. Where they were coming out with like you know, they had Van Helsing and they came out with the Wolfman. They were doing that to make a monster verse where they could bring all the monsters back, and it just it flopped. It flopped because they decided to let Tom Cruise start it with the Mummy, and yes. then from that you get the introduction of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, who I thought Russell Crowe would have been a very good one. Yeah. I was like kind of into that. Universal shits the bed like they usually do and fumbled the bag and couldn't do it. Yeah, I still think that they have the opportunity to do that, though. I think they could really do something positive if they tried to bring back the MonsterVerse. I mean, even if they did, like, a lighthearted comedy, like, you know, like, like Abbott this. Costello, Meet Frank's Night. Like, if they could get two, like, even, hell, do Eddie Murphy and who would be a good Eddie Murphy person? Like, in, like, Eddie Murphy's place? I mean, Eddie Murphy's still acting. No, together. Oh, with Eddie Murphy? Oh, I don't know. He can play off of anybody. Yeah, I, was, I think that if they pa- paired him up with someone... And did like an Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein or, you know. That would so, be fun. Yeah. You know, get some, even, even Adam Sandler. 
you know, get get these two people and make it into like a movie where you could reintroduce the the monsters. Exactly. Or even like we were talking about when we watch Wendell and Wild, like Key and Peele, they're such a good comedy yeah, duo. Yeah. And like I I think like there's there's so much talent that you could redo it now and make it better and yeah. fun. Not bet different, but make it fun and make it these monsters have so much story to them, I think. Yeah, and that's the thing. People today, even the young kids today, know who these creatures are. They Literally. know Frankenstein. They know the Wolfman. I think it would do well if you could find a way to integrate the monsters into a, a group that's doing good now. You know, even if you did something stupid like the Jonas Brothers meet Frankenstein. Oh my God, know, how funny would that yeah, be? Yeah, you know, something really stupid. I mean, and it would it would put the monsters over, and still, you know, it would have the people that are famous right now be over too. Exactly, because this is, I think with these monsters and what I like about the movies that we're covering with these classic monsters is that they bring a lightheartedness and like a joy to them. And it's not just like this straight like action or straight horror or straight like one genre. It's very much like fun, like a stop motion monster movie. Very fun concept. Very cool. Yeah. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Very fun. Very cool. It's just like, but like nowadays, like especially if you look at like The Mummy, that was like a straight action movie. Yes. Which is fine. Yeah. Action movies are fine, but you can do so much more with these characters if you get them out of this like genre, like lane. Like I love, I love genre bending films and I love films that incorporate a bunch of different genres together because then I think that's what gives you like a really fun, exciting, like layered piece. Yeah. I think the Brandon Fraser Mummy. Like the best they, one. Yeah, they could have they could have played off that and done a monster verse off that. Easy. Yeah, because they they introduced the mummy. It was great. Brandon Fraser was a comedy in it. It was funny and lighthearted, and there was some seriousness to it. But it broke the ice. They could have played off that. Absolutely, they absolutely could have. And the I have so much love in my heart for the Brendan Fraser mummies. Both of them are incredible. The casting's amazing. Rachel Weiss and him play together so well. I totally agree. And now Brendan Fraser's having this huge comeback, which I think is incredible. He deserves it. He's one of the best actors. And I would love to see him reprise The Mummy in a way that would be fun because Tom Cruise, I think, is a great... I think he should have been a stunt double. I don't think he should have been a movie star. But he kind of has this like joyless approach to film where it's very like stark and deadpan deadpan action and that that's i'm sick of it i'm bored of it his facial expressions during a movie deadpan he he has no like except for jerry Maguire. I, I like jerry Maguire. I, I don't know i think he has dead eyes yeah he just it, it, he doesn't seem to have joy in his movies no he doesn't and i think that and like the mummy had many failings but like one of them is that like it was joyless it was just bleak and not bleak bleak's the wrong word it was very gray and boring i don't know i was not a fan of of his mummy no, at like, all like if they could do something like they did with this movie the mad monster party where you can get all the monsters together and do some kind, even if you're like on a cruise ship and like you know say that the monsters are all brought onto the cruise ship like abbott and costello when they're in crates so funny yeah. and then you could do something with like that you know and play off that i mean there's a lot of things that you could do and i seriously think that today a monster movie would do well if you did it correctly Exactly. I think, too, I I full heartedly agree. These stories are so universal that you can bring in so many new modern themes into them and make it fun. Yeah. And the monsters basically have like human traits. It's like inner inner fears, inner demons, trying to overcome, overcome inner demons. Even Dracula, even though he's a bad guy, he doesn't want to be exactly. a bad guy. He like in some of the movies, he actually tries to not be a vampire. He's like, I don't want to be a vampire. I want to be human again because it's like one of those. Be careful what you wish for. You know, he wants immortality. He gets it. And then he realizes, you know what? It's not all that's cracked out. Exactly. And I think just from my point of view, why would you want to be immortal? That seems like a curse, not fun at all. That's like to me, that's like the worst part of being a vampire. You get cool clothes. I love a leather vampire. I think they're very funny. But living forever, seeing everyone you know die, seeing the world change for the worse constantly. Yeah, the picture of Dorian Gray. Pictured, I love, see this, okay, so I know I'm going to bring up this movie again. I love The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen because I thought that was actually such a good use of classic literary people. Dorian Gray. Dorian Gray. Great literary, read Dorian Gray. Oh my God, please (laughs) read it because Oscar Wilde, a genius. One, I love the story. It is, it is so good. It's so because like you hate Dorian Gray, but you understand him. I don't know. I can't get onto this rant. But in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, I liked how they brought him and Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde together because I thought as two characters they play very well off each other. Yes. Yeah. 
Yep. And they're both from that like century, like the, the, the aristocratic century exactly. where they dressed you know, like like gentlemen and wore ties and you know, but you even though you looked like a gentleman doesn't mean you actually were a gentleman. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Plus, I don't know. Plus, I love, this is what I thought, too. If you're going to bring the hunch back into this one, you sh- could have brought Dorian Gray. I don't know. Like, to me, it was just, like, arbitrary. I don't, I know why they brought the hunch back, but I did not like it. <laughs> that one, like, I did not like it. But I did like the whole cast of Monsters, and I loved seeing them all together. The best inclusions, I thought, were The Invisible Man and Creature from the Black Lagoon, because I feel like they get forgotten often. Yes. Yep. They're, they're, or they're underplayed where like they just had the invisible man in a movie and it, you know it was more like an invisible bad person that wanted to like kill his wife oh my god the invisible man yeah. so that movie great movie about overcoming your abusers loved it but yeah the the technology of a, being an invisible man is very I think interesting yes yes instead of a serum it was like more glass and mirror yeah it was like a suit that he wore instead of like tur- so he could take it on and off this is my thing. We won't talk. We can cover this movie if you guys want. I'm just going to say one thing. If he was living in that suit, stalking her, it would smell. Yeah. He would smell. Like, it, she would be like, what does that smell? Right? Bought what? Yoda. <laughs> yeah. Like, what am I uh, smelling right now? He'd be sweaty because he's chasing her all the time. I don't know. But I think this movie, M- Mad Monster Party, very fun. If you guys are a fan of stop animation, definitely watch it. Just know that it it is from 1967. Yep. I'd just like to say thank you, Joseph Skuldron Knight. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, listen to the, the podcast we did about a professional wrestling promoter. That's Joseph Skuldron Knight. And when we, we did his interview, he did say, could you do this movie for me? So this is why we did this. And it's such a fun movie. It's such a fun suggestion. It would be nothing that I would pick out for myself, which is what I like in a in a suggestion, because then I'm actually like learning something and broadening my horizons. Right. And if you guys know of a movie that you want us to do, throw it out to us. We'll definitely like it. We'll listen and we'll do it. Yeah. Here's the thing. All we do is watch movies. We love suggestions. We can only suggest the same. <laughs> we just suggest our taste to each other. So if you guys have any things, write into us, DM us, add us. Like we're always around. We want to hear from you because this is we we're like a community. We're like a little family. Yeah. And, you know, as always, we dare you to be different. Be yourselves. Don't let no one tell you that you're not worth anything. And you, you, trust me when I tell you, you are worth everything especially because you listen to this podcast <laughs> i'm just yeah. kidding i'm just kidding Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> all right anything else you want to add no um no we're kind of all over the place in movies maybe we'll do a few holiday ones but with oscar season right around the corner maybe we'll skip the holidays and focus right on the newer oscar bait movies golden globes it's award season baby yeah that's what i'm saying i mean we should i mean I hate to have to skip the Christmas movies because there's so many good ones. So many but, good ones. But I get it. I mean, Oscar season's coming up. We just did Coda last year. Yeah. So we're, we we got a really good review on that. For, like People really liked it. So we're going to do another Oscar one and we'll be out there. Plus, like I feel like there are so many good ones that like like the Banshees of Ear Sheeran, Tar, Everything Everywhere All at Once, The Fablemans, like Bones and all. Like I think this... This Oscar season is going to be really exciting. So I'm excited to talk about it with you guys. Right, sounds fun. We'll see you all next time. Thank you for listening. So tune in next week to What's Happening.